Very good. So just one of the questions which people always have is, should I do this, should I do that? Should I watch the breath, should I change position, should I, should I, should I, should I? Should I concentrate on my breath or should I not concentrate on my breath? Something happens, should I let the breath be or should I just go to somewhere else? Lights come up, should I go to the light or should I just stay with the breath? And all of that is always distracting thoughts. So instead of having the distracting thoughts, what we do is just whatever's in your mind right now, that's what we stay with. Sometimes people ask, what's the best meditation object? It's whatever's in front of your mind right now. People ask, what's the best time to meditate? The best time to meditate is always now. What's the worst time to meditate? Later. <laughs> Pretty obvious answers. But the most important thing is that sometimes people say, oh, my mind is wandering off, should I sort of take it back onto the breath? Or take it back here? You know, that's one of the things which I followed many years for the early part of my meditation practice. Mind wanders off, bring it back again. Mind wanders off, bring it back again. Mind wanders off, bring it back again. You know what happened? The mind kept wandering off again. Never ending. So you know, sometimes you use not just your belief in what your teachers say, but you question, you investigate, you explore, why does my mind wander off? When I'm sitting here meditating, why can't it just be with the breath, nice and peaceful, nice and calm? Why does it keep thinking about all these things which are totally unnecessary? It's like I remember the time when I was a lay person, as a, as a school teacher. You come home from school teaching and you see what's on the TV. In those days, I only had three channels. So you'd serve three channels. These days, people, I don't know how many channels you've got. 60, 70 channels, you serve the channels, this channel, that channel, and then they said there's nothing on TV. 60 or 70 channels! So they go to the refrigerator. <laughs> if things are falling out, there's nothing to eat. You can see that this is the same old problem. You're meditating and you're not satisfied, which means you wander off, searching, surfing the channels of your memory bank, seeing what's in your fantasy fridge, your worry uh, fridge, to see what you can worry about today. We don't really need to do that. It's how we escape from this present moment in memories which you can't change anyway, in dreams and fantasies and fears which will never happen, Fantasies where you can control your, your, your dreams and think you are going to save the world by standing for President of the United States. Or one of my fantasies once was when I found out that the Pope, the head of the Catholic Church, does not need to be a cardinal. They could elect anyone to be the Pope. You don't even need to be a Catholic or a Christian. So when I heard that, I thought, wow, I'm going to send in my CV. Because <laughs> legally, you could do that. Legally, the College of Cardinals, they're the ones who elect, they could elect Ajahn Brahm as the next Pope. That'd be a really cool idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought, what would I do when, <laughs> if I was a Pope? <laughs> pope Brahm the first. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we have those dreams and fantasies of having a bit of fun, but it is because we're not enjoying the peace and the stillness that we go off into these other places. When I notice the mind wandering off, bring it back, it wanders off again, bring it back, wanders off again, bring, why? What is my mind running away from? And the answer was really obvious, it was running away from me. 
my mind and I didn't have a good relationship. I was always trying to improve my mind, change it, making it a better meditator, a more interesting monk, better speaker, better trainer, better whatever. I had this terrible uh, relationship, which was I never realized at the time because everyone else was doing it. It was normal. Train yourself. You can do better. You can sit longer. You can be more deep in meditation. You can be more wise. You can invent more jokes. You can be more, 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 more. And that idea of improvement was always underlied by the sense of not being good enough. The lack of peace and happiness and acceptance of oneself. And so acceptance of this reality of now. And so when you change your attitude to say, I'm good enough, this is good enough. This is you know, what I am, this is how I am, this is, this is the reality of this moment. Instead of trying to change it, I let go. Let go of any measurement of this thing which you call your body and mind. Making peace with this moment, being kind, being gentle with this moment. And those are the three what's called right intentions. I like calling them right motivations. The second factor of the Eightfold Path, which I always call the most forgotten factor of the Eightfold Path. The one which underlies just the motivation, where you're coming from when you're practicing. Not trying to attain something, but making peace with things. One of the things which Ajahn Chah kept on saying, but dummy monk that I was, you, know, you always hear these teachings, but they just go over your head because you think, oh no, that doesn't really apply to me. He was always learning just to let go rather than to attain. We meditate not to get places, not to attain things. We don't meditate to become a so one to get jhanas, to get enlightened, to overcome our problems. That's the wrong attitude. We meditate to let go of things, not to attain things. To disappear, not to make more spiritual achievements, which we can make right out of certificates to put on the wall alongside our certificate of our degree and our doctor's certificate and all these other certificates which people award you in this world. Learning how to let go of things. If it's trying to attain something, your mind will never be peaceful. There's always another place to go, another place to attain. There's always some more to achieve. That's why that reminded of that great monk, Buddha Dasa, who when he was building his hall, like building NBM, Newbury Buddhist Monastery. When they said, when is it going to be finished? He said, what's done is finished. So, Newbury Buddhist Monastery, it's finished. <laughs> what's done is finished. So anyway, so when one uh, meditates, the reason why we wander off is because we think there's more to be done, more to be achieved, more to be learned, more to be got rid of, and that's the, not the way of meditation. The way of meditation is making peace with things, being content, not proud or demanding in nature, being easily satisfied. For those of you that rings a bell, that is part of the English translation of the Metta Sutta. Let, you, let, let them not be proud and conceited, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise will be later reprove. May be contented and easily satisfied. Are you easily satisfied? Or do you want more? If you're easily satisfied, then the more comes to you. Ajahn Chah, one of his first teachings, which also went over the head when I first was there, it was a simile of the mango grove. 
I thought it was the craziest of similes my mad master could ever devise. He said, what pa pa I gotta okay, I'll pause a minute. Okay. Because it is important for kindness and compassion. Because if you know this keeps on happening, what what occurs is even during the talks, you have to keep on interrupting the talks. Which is, you know, just disturbing for everybody. So anyway, <coughs> uh, back to the <coughs> what happens uh, when you are meditating. You wander off because you're not content with this moment. You're not making peace with this moment. So your job in meditation is actually to learn. So whatever you're experiencing in meditation, to make peace with it. Be kind to this moment. Be gentle with this moment. And to emphasize that, that I now go on to that wonderful method of meditation called the Empress Three Questions Meditation. I think you all know the Empress Three Questions. When is the most important time? Who is the most important person? No! Oh, you crikey, you haven't been paying attention <laughs> reading my books. Anyone who said, I oh, you got to buy a copy of, uh, of opening the door of your heart. The most important person is the one right in front of you, whoever that happens to be. Yeah. You're the most important person in the world to me now, <laughs> young lady. Well, not anymore, now Priya is, now Frank is. Similarly, Vajan Chao, yeah, I'll go back to that in a moment. But that, let's we let that one go because that's not in right in front of us at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> that the most important person is the one you're with, and the most important thing to do is to care. Very simple. Not to change somebody. As a doctor, you know that. Not to cure people, but to care for them. And then the cure happens automatically as a result of that. If you care for somebody, they don't run away. So I always remember that with my mind. Whatever I'm aware of, whatever it is I'm aware of, it's important because it's happening now. This moment, whatever object is in front of your mind, is the most important meditation object in the whole world. What do you do with it? Should I go back to the breath, get rid of it, develop it? Care for it. Have this beautiful open the door of your heart to whatever you're experiencing right now. So, in your meditation, you may start by watching your body, but the most important thing to do is to care for it. It's right here. Then peaceometer to care for it. You find you'll get very peaceful. Then you may have your breath coming up. You may have an itchy nose if you've got the hay fever like me. You may have an ache or a pain somewhere. Whatever it is, make sure it's the most important thing in the world for you. You may have the sound of the truck outside. You may have the sound of, of people coughing or moving. If it's happening now, it's important. Don't try and, and judge it, get rid of it, diminish its importance, demean it. Just if it's happening right now, it's important. And care for it. Because you find the objects of meditation, they're just like the landmarks on the journey. They're not so important as the fact you're going in the right direction. That you are practicing present moment. Whatever's in front of you is important. Be with it and care for it. And that's how you develop. So if you ever have any doubts in the meditation, what should I be doing? That's a wrong question. It's not what you should be doing, but what's right in front of your mind right now? And are you caring for it, or are you trying to get rid of it? If you're trying to get rid of it to achieve something you think is far, far better, you'll never get anywhere in meditation. If you stay in this moment, this is important, whatever you're experiencing right now, you care for it, really care for it. 
then you find it develops, you become really peaceful. You never go on to the next stage of meditation. You always go in. Where you are right now, you go deeper into it. Deeper and deeper into it. You don't move, you go in. So that is a way of meditation, and that's a little segue to Ajahn Chah's simile, which I never understood until much later, when he said his monastery, Wat Bapong, was a mango orchard. And then he started saying that all those trees were planted by the Buddha. And you know, not really appreciating the metaphor, I thought this was crazy, because if you plant a mango tree, it doesn't last 2,500 years. <laughs> And there weren't any mango trees in Wat Pong at the time. And anyway, he said, and in those mango trees planted by the Buddha, the mangoes are ripe. There's thousands of them and the sweetest, juiciest mangoes you could ever eat. All ripe and ready. But, he said, if you want one of those sweet, juicy fruits, the mangoes, if you climb the tree, you will never reach the mangoes. If you shake the tree, no mangoes will fall. If you throw up a stick to try and hit one of the mangoes to make it fall, it will not fall. These days you say, if you get a cherry picker, it will never get high enough to get those mangoes. So there's only one way, only one way to get a mango from the trees planted by the Buddha, the sweetest and juiciest mangoes ever. And that is to sit underneath the mango tree, perfectly still. What I mean, perfectly still. Not perfectly concentrated, not perfectly mindful, but perfectly still. And then open up your hand and a mango will fall. Such BS, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being honest with you, I didn't understand that crazy teaching. Uh, have you ever sat under a mango tree or an apple tree? As it open up your hand? You think it's gonna fall? No way. If it does fall, where's it gonna fall? <laughs> On your head, yeah. <laughs> With your bad karma, <laughs> my bad karma too. So uh, that's crazy. But then after a while, when you started doing your meditation, you tried to make things happen. Shake the, the jhana tree <sighs> to make insight happen. Come on, what effort? Come on, you can do this. Try and climb up the, the Bodhi tree to find some wisdom. You find you can't do it. It doesn't work. So instead, you find the insight understanding. I'm just running away from things. That's why my mind is always restless, always looking for something else, never actually being here, and realize you have more than enough right now. So whatever I'm experiencing right now, right now is important to me. It's the most important meditation object in the whole world. When I was meditating, this really itchy nose which wanted to explode in a sneeze. It was important to me, not my breath. I wasn't trying to avoid it, not trying to get rid of it, not trying to heal it, but to be with it. It was important. And care for it. It's beautiful care. So that's how I was meditating. When you are sick, when you are dying, when you have got no energy at all. That's why I was meditating when I had the typhus fever. Not trying to get rid of it, overcome it, escape from it, but go right into it. It's the most important thing in the world, to be with it. Remember Ajahn Chah telling me how, how he overcame his, his um, uh, malaria fever. He was let's say the malaria fever, they always had malaria. And one day he was in his heart, I think it was in Wapapong, having an early days, having malaria fever. 
And again, after a while, people get fed up. It doesn't work running away, trying to just endure it. Just like, you know, you trying to get some deep meditation. It doesn't work. Bring the mind back, it's just endless. And so after a while, you do try another way. So he was, they went right inside the malaria fever. Right in the middle of it. Always in, 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 in. Until he said he got to a place right in the middle of this really hot fever like in the eye of a storm. And he could feel, this is a cool place he described it, really cool, but he could feel just around him was this fire, like a forest fire, like a furnace getting hotter and hotter. But he was right in the middle of it. If he moved, he'd get burnt. Right in the middle, he was safe, cool. Hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, incandescent, and then it exploded. And that was the last time he had malaria fever. Do you understand? No, you don't. <laughs> but it gives you the indication. You go inside of things. Now is the only time you have. Whatever you're experiencing, even the unpleasantness of a malaria fever, you go into it. It's important to you. Really in, investigate. Go inside, feel it. It's deep and deep, but don't run away. Don't keep bringing the mind back. If it wants to run away, go with it. <laughs> and be very careful, because you know, sometimes people think I'm a holy monk, and they will take these and use them for relics. <laughs> keep your hand off. <laughs> you know, my dentist, my dentist, I don't know, well, no, I trust him. But my dentist over in Perth, there was some time ago, I had a cracked tooth, and he said, you've got no choice, you have to sort of extract it. So he took the tooth out, and it was no problem at all. But then later on, he made a confession to me. Because usually, if you've got like a tooth, which has been, you throw it away. But he decided to keep it as an investment for his future. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, at, you know, I'm not up to the Buddha standard, obviously, but you know, the Buddha's holy tooth relic, oh, that's worth a lot. You know, just in Sri Lanka, oh, that's the... <laughs> but you know what happened? He moved his surgery, and in the process of moving the surgery, he lost it, couldn't find it. <laughs> so I'm a bit concerned if I go to his surgery again. He said, I think your tooth needs to be taken out. <laughs> Are you sure? Why? <laughs> no, he's a good, he's a very good dentist. <laughs> he doesn't mind me telling that joke. But anyway, the, 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 whatever's in front of your mind right now is the most important thing in the world. So don't choose your meditation object. Whatever is there, the choice has already been made. Because if you say you're watching, you're watching the breath, and you think, oh, well, now I should go and watch the uh, the um, the nimitta or something, you're just making choices. You're disturbing the whole process. Your job is just to be a passive observer. Whatever's happening right now is all you need to do. The mind wanders off. Fine, wander off. Don't do anything. Care for the mind. If my mind wants to wander off, okay, off you go, wander off. If it gets tired, let it fall asleep. If it wants to sneeze, it sneezes. I'm totally with my mind, caring for it. And that means you get so peaceful. And it means that you can meditate any time, any place, no matter what you're experiencing. Even if you're sick, even when you're dying. When you're dying, it's sometimes very hard to watch the breath when you've got no breath. <laughs> so what do you do? You're aware of something. The way you're aware of, that's your object. It's important. Care for it. Now imagine this is one of the problems that comes up in meditation. Sometimes when people are watching the breath, when they're watching the breath, it gets very peaceful, 
start to disappear and they can't see the breath anymore but there's no nimitta yet. All that's really happening is you haven't got enough energy, enough oomph. You're doing too much. Usually you're supposed to get the delightful breath first of all. Really just the breath, breathing in, whoa. Breathing out, oh, this is nice. Breathing in, oh yeah, I can take more of this. Breathing out, wow. Relax, oh, to the max, oh yeah. That's emphasizing a bit over the top, but <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> it gets you <laughs> some of the idea. The breath is nice, it's lovely. And as I said last night, just whatever you're watching, even the contents of your toilet bowl, Wow! This is, I'd say that's gross, but you remember it? So, this is nature. When the mind is still, the mindfulness gets empowered. Whatever you watch is beautiful. So obviously, it should be pretty easy. You're watching your breath, breathing in. It's so delightful, just the breath coming into your body. And breathing out, oh, it's joyful. That's part of Anapanasati. Breathing in, breathing out, experiencing Priti Sukha. This is the joy and the happiness, the energy, the power. And it also means that when that breath vanishes, you've still got the joy, the happiness. Which means your mind is energized enough. When the breath disappears, it's quite easy to watch the beautiful light. You rush too fast, you haven't got the joy yet, it means you can't notice this joyful light, which is called the nimitta. So what happens? People are meditating, they're watching their breath, they get calm, the breath disappears and nothing there. What should I do? There's something there. You're aware? You're mindful? What are you aware of? Whatever it is you're aware of, that's the only thing you need to notice. So just stay with that darkness, emptiness, nothingness, doesn't matter what it is, stay there. Don't choose. Whatever it is, is the most important meditation object in the whole world. You've got to learn this. You don't learn it by going on to somewhere else. Stay there. And just be kind. To this state of mind you can't really understand because you can't give it a name because you can't take notes about it you can't photograph it all your usual ways of understanding are taken away so just be with it and then after a little while it will get very light and bright when it's ready so it's not your job to drive the vehicle of meditation. You're the passenger. And don't be a backseat driver <laughs> telling your mind what to do, pretending you're not really driving this, this vehicle of meditation. You just take your hands off the steering wheel, feet off the pedal, let go. Whatever you're experiencing right now is important. Care for it. And that's how we meditate. Okie okay, okay. remember be sensitive, be kind. May all sentient beings be happy and well, including our neighbours. So just have a look. If, if they're upset, there must be a reason for it. So see if you can just be a bit kinder. And anyway, if you do come in a car, park a bit further away. And then you get exercise which is a wonderful thing to do. There are so many streets, just not so far away from here is Karma Street. <laughs> and a bit further down is Nirvana Street. <laughs> what better place to park your car than in Nirvana Street? It's only a few streets up the road. And then you can actually come and walk from there, and when you walk from there, you know that you're always, after you come to the BSV for a retreat, you're always going to Nirvana after the, <laughs> after the session. <laughs> so that's true, just down the road is Karma Street, Nirvana Street. I knew you'd do it much better than me. <laughs>
<laughs> no. Anyway, so let's please be kind, otherwise it affects everybody. Okay, so there's 15 minutes before lunch, so let's do a 15 minute meditation. So please park your car, called your body. Bring attention to your body sitting here. And what are you aware of right now? Whatever it is, don't try and get rid of it. Don't try and hold on to it. Let it go, and then wipe it afterwards. <laughs> it's important. Care for it. Making peace, being kind, being gentle.
it's really close to the end of this short meditation. And I've been a ring the gong three times. <laughs>